In 1873, a Greek priest was thumbing through a book in a Jerusalem monastery library when he found tucked in, among other early Christian works, a short writing about the life of the first century communities, a writing that had been lost for hundreds of years. It's now known as the Didache, the teaching. It contains, among other things, a lengthy discussion on the Eucharist. There is a Eucharistic prayer that has no reference to the Last Supper, has no reference to the words of institution of the bread and wine. Instead, it describes a meal that brings people together from all sections of society. It prefers phrases like sharing a loaf or drinking from a common cup rather than eating bread and drinking wine. It is the act of sharing, the Didache posits, not the nature of what is eaten that creates the church. It is the simplicity and challenge of rich and poor, slave and free, old and young, male and female, all sharing together that creates the sacrament known as the Eucharist. The early church was very aware of both the spiritual and political power of sharing. From the Jerusalem community of Acts 4 to the sermons of John Chrysostom in the 4th century, the church has been at its most attractive when it has stood with the poor in their need against the rich in their greed. It's the experience of many today that wealthy elites have been holding clippers and sharing the wool from the backs of the poor. Those elites have built up a financial system to support their fleecing. Most of us have colluded with it, believing their logic and remaining docile. We want to believe their wealth has been earned and we, or our children, can do likewise. We want to believe that the astronomical gains of the very rich are at nobody's expense. We want to believe that through the miracle of some lottery, we too can join their ranks. Yet at the same time, while although we can imagine a chief executive earning $300,000, 10 times the minimum wage. When it comes to 100 times the minimum wage, or 3 million, there's something that we feel intrinsically wrong. The foul odor of greed hangs in the air. There is also in the air the cries of those in need, the statistics, as well as mapping the increasing gulf between the top and the bottom incomes, tells us of increasing suffering, not just in some faraway place, but in our own communities and neighborhoods. The conservative politicians, the rich and their believers, excuse inequity with the chant, there's no other way. Don't worry, be happy, they seem to say. We rich know what we're doing, just trust and obey. Well, we church know the mantra of trust and obey. It's a mantra that hides a plethora of ecclesiastical crimes, like creating dependency in order to keep status and power, like keeping parishioners ignorant of the scholarship that strikes at the foundations of hierarchy, like sexual harassment and abuse of women and children. Such a mantra and the systems it supports need the cleansing winds of transparency 
accountability, and mutuality. The scripture reading today from Matthew can be read as an anti-Semitic diatribe. Yet if the accusations are truthful, they reveal the potential failings of any religious elite, Jewish or Christian. Matthew asks some pertinent questions like, is scripture a body of commands to follow to the letter? Or wise counsel from the past to be interpreted by love? Are titles, garments, and other badges of office for the purpose of shoring up the egos and power of a few? Or for the purpose of empowering the whole community? In a community that recognizes the rights, needs, dignity, and contributions of everyone, how should leadership be exercised? And what does humility mean? Rabbi Jonathan Sachs writes about humility. He says, true humility does not mean undervaluing yourself. It means valuing other people. It signals a certain openness to life's grandeur and the willingness to be surprised, uplifted by goodness, wherever one finds it. I've been meditating on these wise words of the rabbi as I've followed the events unfolding around St. Paul's Cathedral in London and how if these events had unfolded around St. Matthew's, we might have had the humility and commitment to respond differently. On October the 21st, the Occupy Wall Street movement crossed the Atlantic and hit the streets of London, like it has the streets of Auckland. The movement is a reaction, a protest, against the greed and destruction wrought by a few upon the many. It's primarily about wealth and poverty and the destructiveness of poverty on people and the environment. For anyone who has ever read the Bible, these issues are familiar. The passion to address them, the passion for justice, is God's passion. You cannot read the Bible and believe that God is happy with our status quo. In London, the protesters, probably trying to avoid being moved on by police, came to the steps and precinct of St. Paul's. There, Canon Giles Fraser offered a form of sanctuary and shooed the police away. St. Paul's welcomes everyone, protesters included. Canon Fraser's actions were reported around the world and the church's credibility soared for a moment. But action grounded in the liberal theology of inclusivity is sadly not enough. When storms come, this theology's foundation can waver. To endure, it has to be grounded, I believe, in a theology of outrageous humility. For a week, campers, cathedral, and chapter tried to live together. And you can imagine the issues. For the campers, there was sanitation and hygiene, cooking, a place to meet and gather and discuss. For the cathedral, there was the potential and the real disruption to its many activities. The cathedral has 200 paid staff. It collects 16,000 pounds per day from tourists. It has multiple services and events. All of this was compromised. 